I be okay. Uh, looking good when they started as a Zisu suitors, they were looking like fade. They look real sharp and wait, yeah. They look real sharp, double the money for a suit to match. So when we went down to the dance, you would look good. The suit made out of the same material. Shark skin was the best. Shark skin suits are, wait, shark suit skins, suit, wait, shark skin suits in different colors. They look nice. Okay. Skull shoes and hats. If you went to the tailor, he would, it costs, it would cost you by an inch the cost, but if you want it, it if you wanted it one inch longer, you would pay th that much more money for it. And then we all had better light shoes and real Uh, X Men. Okay. X Men. Oh no. Um, I don't know how to say that word. Um, featherweight shoes. Uh, for dancing. They didn't have no tick solace or nothing. Oh. Okay, extreme the suitors. Okay, they went to the stream. They wore a big hat and feathers and changed angle. Oh, hold on. Women and girls wore skirts, long jackets, knee-length socks, and white boots. The hair was in pompadours with artificial flowers in them, low-waisted dresses that gave them room for their knees to, to dance and turn. Hair maintenance was an issue. Women had to use pens, gauze wrappings, and nets for their hair to stay up. Many parents of the women and girls thought, thought that their daughters would change into something more classy and civilized. In this case, many daughters rebelled against their parents. It was described as a mirror ball that had different colored lights. They played romantic ballads like Embraceful You and Sentimental Journey, and people would dance to them. Some would say it was an exciting place to be because you would see a variety of men in, in, in sailor suits, army, green, and, and khaki suits, and some in suit suits. The women would feel cherished there. The men would ask them to dance. Hall ages would be at these dance halls. It was described as a Latin jitterbug and a Latin swing. If you're dancing with a sailor, you would do the regular jitterbug. If you were to dance with a zoo suitor, you would do the bachuco hop. It just depends on your partner. When the women danced with the zoo suitors, the men wouldn't move or dance. The women had to go around him. They would twirl and move around the man while he's while he holds his arm out. He doesn't want to mess up his pants or coat. And this is just the information. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go. Um, hold on. All right, thank you, Jacqueline, and thank you, Gabriel. Um, while Jacqueline is, is logging out and Matthew is on his way up here to come in next. Um, uh, you know, and we didn't do this with the first one and I, we probably should have. Is there anything that any of the professors would like to comment? I know uh, Dr. Oralio talked about the shoes. Is there anything you would like to inform the students about or comment on the project? I was, um... 
I was a, a child growing up at the tail end of the Pachuco culture. And um, a lot of the adults had problems with it as adults have always had with the teenagers in this country who developed their own styles. But there was a certain setup of, of words, for example, that came from that culture. Uh, shirt was Lisa, uh, pants was tramos or tramaos, shoes were calcos. And I think some of the terms are still used. Uh, Trajos were cigarettes. Um, and so uh, there was a, there, the culture had uh, words, a language, but it also was seen in films. You know, a lot of the Mexican films had uh, the zoot suit style in them. Uh, and many parents disliked it. They said, that's, that's pachuco, that's underclass. But the more it was criticized, the more the young people would, would take it on, as it happens now. In other words, it seems that the, the, the period of being a teenager is when you are challenging adult culture. And in that case, it was the, the young Chicanitos who were saying, this is who we are, this is our style. And uh, what bothered a lot of families in the country was that the zoot suit became a style for many young people around the country just like young people will attack black, black styles and stuff like that. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't know that the shirts were called Lisa's. I, I think- uh... Lisa, Tramos, Calcos, Frajo. Mm -hmm. Frajo is like the cigarettes, right? Or is yes. that- Right, yeah. yeah. Trolas, I think were, were uh, matches. Yeah. A quarter was a cuida. Oh, guys, say, no trae una cuida para el wine. Oh my gosh, yes. My grandfather would say that, would use that word. <laughs> and, you, also, the older, and, and it was during the Second World War, and there was some a word that they described, somebody that looked slick was called que giri se mira, que giri. And I don't know where it came from, but it was it was used for when, for example, a young soldier would come back in his uniform, ay mijo que giri te miras, you know? But it was also uh, the adult saying, or they were saying, I like your style, that's, that's a beautiful style, que giri se mira. Oh, but 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 there was a strong reaction. I was always banned from talking Pachuco talk, hanging out with them, uh, stuff like that, because uh, uh, a lot of the adults saw it as as uh, as a gang culture, and it really wasn't. There was it was much more than that. But um, uh, uh, adults were concerned about their children following that those cultural uh, traits. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. That was very, very useful. <laughs> if gonna... you see 1950s movies from the Mexico, Tintan, and some other comedians adopted the style. They, they, they used the words a lot of times from the Pachuco culture in Mexico. And um, you could see that if you ever see the 50s movies, comedies from Mexico with the comedians, you'll see this style clearly, how they dress, how they talk, the hats with the long feathers. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a statue of, I think it's Tintan in Juarez in, uh, in La Placita, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong, but I think pretty sure it was Tintan. Um, but we are now going to be moving on to Matthew, and Matthew is going to present. You gotta stay close. Uh, my name is Matthew Duran, and I'll be talking about Clem Peoples and the LAPD. Clem Peoples was a criminal the chief criminal investigator for the Los Angeles Police Department during what was known to be one of the most corrupt and racist police departments in the United States. He doomed the LAPD's relationship with the majority, with majority of the minority groups in Los Angeles. He profiled young Mexican-Americans who wore zoot suits. He handled the zoot suit riots terribly and sent 22 young Mexican-Americans to jail with painted evidence. The Jose Diaz murder case had plenty of attention on it. So Clem Peoples and the LAPD found about 600 suspects that so happened to be Mexican-American and questioned on women. Out of the 600, only 22 were put, were, were put on trial for the murder. So Clem Peoples decided to write Smashing California's Baby Gangsters, which was a completely false story made up to, and was made up to put all 22 men behind bars. It was also used to turn the public against the Mexican American men by stating false but gruesome stories that did turn the public but were also completely false. In 1938, the city of Los Angeles found out that Mayor Frank Shaw had a connection that also made its way to corrupt the LAPD. He was removed from office and many police officers assigned with him. He was replaced with Fletcher Bauer, 
and they and the police decided to change their policy from responsive to preventative, which meant the active hunting of young minorities, especially the ones dressed in zoot suits, to prevent crimes. The LAPD started to, to target any minority, but especially the ones with zoot suits. The police would arrest and assault any minority wearing zoot suits, no matter what they were doing. Innocent kids that were just my age could be walking down the street or maybe going to get food from the store. The police would pull over and arrest them for just being a Mexican American wearing baggy clothes. The Mexican American community did not take kindly to this, which led to the Zoot Suit riots. During the Zoot Suit riots, the police were nowhere to be found. They waited until the sailors were finished with the neighborhood and then decided to go in and arrest the minorities that were attacked. The LAPD was called out by many major news com companies for the mishandling of the riots. Then the LAPD decided to blame the riots on the zoot suiters, which caused an outrage in the community. Sadly, the wrongful treating of minorities by the police is still happening to this day. Minorities are still harassed for simply walking down the street in baggy clothes. There are still protests going on about unlawful killings by the police. The United States is a broken place by right now, but right now we're taking small but necessary steps to help improve ourselves with this problem. So you're saying 80 years later, it's still the same problem? Yeah. What, Matthew, what do you think your, what, what was your favorite part about learning during this research? How it can still uh, represent what's going on in the United States today. Okay. It still goes on to this day. Let's go. Uh, all right. Thank you, Matthew. It, and they're noisily getting up and on their way over here. Um, I've been in Castillo. Uh, okay. Uh, is there anything that any of the professors would like to uh, bring up points or uh, any critiques on the project or anything at all? Hi, Michael. Hi, everyone. This is Margaret Cantu Sanchez. Thank you for having me here and thank you to, uh, to the presenters. Those were really great, especially this last presentation. Um, I really, really appreciate and um, like that you are making connections to today's world. So one of the things I think is important to notice is the ways that we continue um, in some ways to discriminate, uh, especially based on looks and clothes. So um, that last slide there is important. And when I'm thinking about the zoot suits, I'm thinking about things like hoodies um, nowadays or even the very strict um, um, attire and rules that you have to abide by, especially in high schools. Um, and a lot of those are, uh, are traced back to these stereotypes um, associated with certain groups um, and coming from, stemming from history. So I think that's really, really important to stress. And I'm glad that you guys are, are talking about that in this class. So thank you. And thank you for having me. I don't know. Thank you. Um, let's ask the students. Students, do you all think that any dress codes are based that, that we have here at Judson, and she brought up the hoodies that are maybe based off stereotypes. Hats, yes. Hats, yeah, that's actually a big one. Jacqueline, you shake your head, yes. Do you have any? I know you're a little distant, so we won't be able to hear you, but you can mute yourself. Uh, hoodies. What about them? Um, they say you can't like, like uh, identify a person by that, and it's really stupid of me. Okay. Also, um, when people sag. Um, and uh, Devin, do you, Devin, do you want to say anything about the hats? Yeah. Yeah. I guess hats have a big impact, I guess, because, you know, most schools don't allow them. Because, you know, I guess it covers your face and stuff. I don't know. Okay. So we're moving on here. So big issue, how some schools judge the norm on how hair should be worn. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we are going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, hi. 
My name is uh, John G. Escobedo. Uh, hi, my name is John G. Escobedo with my partner, uh, Devin Allen. Hey, yo. Uh, our topic today will be the Sleepy Lagoon descendants. Uh, just for a little background, the Sleepy, the Sleepy Lagoon murder was the uh, murder of Jose Diaz. He, wa he was found dying near the Sleepy Lagoon Reservoir, I believe, with a fractured skull. Uh, Mexican teenagers were profiled and and uh, arrested, le leading to 17 of them um, getting charged with, with murder. Many of the Mexican and boys being beaten, uh, beaten out uh, to give false confessions. Jose Reyes, Jose ha has had a history of being an aggressive criminal, such as assault with a, de with a deadly weapon. Later in his life, he was denied a defense job due to not being an American citizen. Jose has also had a history of, uh, with police brutality, Within May 1943, being being with the butt of a gun by an officer. Upon questioning of the Sleepy Lagoon murder, he was beaten by the arresting officer. Manuel Manny uh, Reyes Salazar. Manuel had a record of being a violent man, or just police record in general. During the questioning that showed him, he was brutally beaten. Uh, he, wait, he had a uh, brutally beaten body of a defendant. Henry uh, Levas later testified that he made his entire confession up to a man and that he was scared of his own well being. This case for it was eventually overturned as he spent a total of two years in jail. Angel Paladia, Paladia. Uh, Angel Paladia was out of high school at the time of his criminal record started. started. He put out years of probation. Grand Nevado, or uh, Grand Nevado, he was also been arrested for uh, lottering in schools while trying to pick up girls. Dang, what a perv. During his arrest for the sleepy lagoon murder, he was beaten up so bad that you could not tell his face for a week. The importance of this case, so the importance of the significance of this case is to clear prejudice against Mexicans with little to no evidence. They arrested 17 Mexican boys with bad backgrounds the chief of Los Angeles Sheriff's Office, Duran Ares, testified that Mexicans were naturally violent and hate bloodthirst. Wait, had bloodthirst, not hate. First of all, that's a lie. Anyways, the historian significance in the case of the media response and the argument for the that prejudice uh, demonstra uh, demonstrated during this case contributed to hostility towards Mexican communities, and that can be traced back to the studying Jiu-Jitsu rights. Also, a shout out to Mr. Domain for this. And go. Um, Devin, is there anything that you enjoyed learning about while researching this case? Yes. I enjoyed it. Don't talk to me, talk to me. <laughs> yes, Mr. Domain, great question. Most of the people had pretty interesting background, you know? Especially smart boys. Uh, any other question? Um, were you able to connect that to anything in 2021, America 2021? I mean, the world, it's always under the threat against people, you know? So I guess you can kind of connect it uh, in America in one way, with, you know, some of the protests that goes on and, you know, yeah. Okay. John Jesus, uh, is there anything that you enjoyed learning about while researching this case? Uh, yeah, I enjoyed learning about the background to the uh, Zutsu rights. It was interesting seeing the connection between the Sleepy Lagoon murder and how it led up to the Zutsu rights. It's a fact on it. Okay. Um, is there any connection you think to modern day America 2021? I think there could be some connection in how the police can uh, uh, both police brutality and how the uh, confessions can be forced. Oh, okay. forcing of confessions. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Um, any response from uh, any of the prof no, 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 don't, don't move it. Hello? Okay, is there anything that any of the professors would like to comment on or uh, any questions they might have for John Jesus or Devin? I'd like to uh, commend the presenters for making the connections, you know, between the ways that the media portrayed Mexican American youth as violent and the media as the presenters uh, stated had a lot to do with the public perception of this case um, and, and, and had a huge impact on the ways in which Mexican American youth were, were perceived by the dominant group and were portrayed. And so it did contribute to the criminalization of Mexican people, um, particularly um, youth. And we can see that today, right? The impact of the media and the ways in which they portray, you know, blacks, the way that they portray immigrants and other non-dominant groups. Excellent point that you've made. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, anything else? No. no. <laughs> so I'm present. So hello, I'm Juan Estrella. I'm presenting Jose Gallo Diaz, 19, 19 from 1942. His trial was his trial. Jose Gallardo was born on December 9, 1999, in a small town of Durango, Mexico. Teodolo Diaz and Bachila Gallardo Diaz were their parents, were, were his parents. Just four years later, him and, him and his family had to leave because of what the Mexican Revolution left behind, which was little food supplies and little food water. After leaving uh, uh, Durango, they settled somewhere along, somewhere outside of Los Angeles. They lived in the bunkhouse that was surrounded by other bunkhouses. All of, there were people there and they all worked in town farmhouses. Well, they dropped that out after eighth grade. This adolescence was, uh, Jose's older sister, Socorro, and older brother, Lino Diaz, also worked in the farm with them. Jose Diaz, no, although Diaz was young, he, uh, his brother and his sister described him as a very conservative, deserved and quiet person. Jose also was a big fan of the jazz pusher. His sister remembered him as wearing, remember him wearing a white shirt, tight pants, and, and what were a part of the controversial suit suits. He, were, he would always wear something like that to, to parties or dances. In the summer of 1942, Jose enrolled in World War II. He was, he was in a way excited to be in the war. His mother on the other hand, on the, on the other hand was, was completely out there. She was very anxious for him. The week before him leaving the, to the army, he was sent to take his first ever picture. He was very, he was well, very well dressed and very ready to take the picture. And that was the only picture they had of him. Before his death, on the same weekend that he took his picture, he was invited to a party from his neighbor. Just uh, uh, before he went to the party, he told his mom that he didn't want to go. He just had a bad feeling in general about going to it, but he still ended up going. And he had fun there, dancing and all that. But uh, after 1 a.m., he left with his two friends, um, Luis Vargas and Andrew Torres. 10 to 20 minutes later, after them walking to, um, for the house, a group of kids from 38th Street or were seeking revenge for one of the um, one of the beatings they had, like they were had an uh, argument or whatever. And one Hank, like Hank, Hank, uh, was the one that took uh, Jose's life. He got sent to, and he got sent to prison. One while the other friends in prison got also prison time. Jose was found out early in the morning. And his pockets turned outside, inside out, and was bleeding out because of the stabs. Oh, stabs, stab wounds. And he he went. He was rushed to the hospital, but passed away due to a uh, vascular skull fracture. And those are vacation. Huh? Oh, that's a picture of um, his grave. And with the six. Uh, it's uh, Jose uh, at the Calvary Cemetery um, in Los Angeles, California. Yeah. 
Gwen, what, was there anything you found very interesting while doing your research? I heard that he was like very uh, to himself. He didn't like, uh, he wasn't like very argumentative with other people. So he never really had any problems. And he was just like caught out of nowhere because of the kids from 38th Street. So he was there just like, uh, I wouldn't say an accident, but just uh, to work. He was involved. He wasn't really involved in what happened. Huh? Oh, so say about that's the word. Uh, yeah, that's the word. Okay. All right. Um, you have any questions? All right. Oh, uh, there is a question. Were those who were found guilty of this murder the actual perpetrators, or did they get forced confessions to? They were part of what, um, they also, they were somehow involved in what happened. But the, they were, um, I think they also beat them, but, uh, uh, what was his name again? Who was that killed him? Um, Henry Levis? Yeah, him. He was, uh, he was the only one that found actually like, guilty for it. The only one just because they were like abusing him, like uh, fighting him and stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So we have uh, one more presenter. She is doing it online. Her name is Vianca Asavedo. Vianca, are you ready? Hello. Yes. Okay. I'm ready. Um, good morning. My name is Bianca Acevedo. And I will be presenting on Enrique Henry's Reyes Leivas. Um, here I will be, um, sorry, um, here I will be clearing off on things like the Lagoon um, case, and I will be clearing off on his life and how his how he had like a history with criminal experience. So let's start with Enrique, which he was experiencing several confrontations with the Los Angeles police, being in cuffs and mistreated way too many times. He was simply having a long troubled history with the police. Eventually, the police labeled him as a delinquent with a chip on his shoulder when the family said that he's been standing up for his right this whole time. Enrique Henry Reyes Leivas was one of the eldest of 10 children raised in Los Angeles by his parents, Guadalupe Reyes and Saferino Gaminos Leivas. Henry Leivas, often called Hank by his friends, Lupe Leivas' younger sister remembers her brother as being kind-hearted, loyal, and courageous. He kept himself very neatly groomed and wore draped pants, cuffed at the ankle, and open-necked shirts. For special occasions, he would wear a called zoot suit. He was a skilled mechanic and other boys in the neighborhood looked up to him because he was always fixing their cars. His parents used to always defend Leva, saying how he was the kind of kid who would stand up for his rights. He would protest it if, if he was arrested. His first capture came when he and Seth were pulled over by the police for car theft. The vehicle was owned by their dad However, the Levas were held in prison for three days until their dad could demonstrate that he actually owned the vehicle. On, a, on another event, the siblings were captured together for assault with deadly weapons and held for three months before their court appearance. They were cleared on all charges. Levas was again captured with four others and this time accused of threatening behavior, despite the fact that the crime happened two days before his release. Henry was beaten by the police at that event. After seven days, the Los Angeles police captured him for battling and he went through 72 hours in prison before he was let out. He was most recognized for the murder of Jose Diaz. The events of the night on August 1 of 1942 were used by Los Angeles police as an opportunity to finally suppress the presence of Mexican youth on the streets. Henry Leivas found himself to their prime target. That night would change Leivas' life forever. 
Henry Leyva's, his girlfriend, and a group of kids from the 38th Street neighborhood were at the Sleepy Lagoon. They used the term Sleepy Lagoon after a popular song, As a Lover's Lane, a local swimming hole that turned into a popular hangout spot at night. Henry and his girlfriend were approached by a car filled with boys from the Downey neighborhood that began shouting at the couple. After the shouting match, the boys got out of the vehicle and started beating them. After the fight, Hank, Dora, and the others went back to the 38th Street for reinforcements. They gathered a large group of friends and returned to the William Ranch. They found the area deserted. The 38th Street group then near, head, headed to a nearby birthday party at the Delgadillo residence, believing that they would run into the Downey boys. The boys from Downey had in fact been at the party before the assault on Henry and Dora, but the Delgadillos had ordered them to leave when they became unruly. The 38th Street group arrived at the Delgadillo ready for a confrontation and a fight quickly broke out. An intense fight ensued when the boys arrived and the Delgadillos lasted about 10 minutes. The altercation disbanded when somebody yelled that the police had been contacted. Among most seriously injured was a party goer named Jose Diaz. Diaz unfortunately died early that morning. That's when the police stamped into action. They took the murder as an opportunity to show their force within the community as well to target Mexican American youth, whom they believe to be dangerous and out of control. The Los Angeles police began to seize Mexican youth off the streets in search of suspects. 20 adolescents were put on trial for the murder of Jose Diaz. Most of the defendants were young Mexican Americans. During the trial, the media generally portrayed the defendants as uneducated, belligerent, filthy delinquents that were out of control. It has been shown that even in the trial, there was some sort of bias since the, judge, the, since the judge ruled that the boys could not wash and had to wear the same clothes they were arrested in. And even, even the boys' lawyers were not allowed to sit or counsel them during the trial. Despite effort from the defense team, Judge Fick and prosecutors referred to the defendants as gang members and labeled Henry Levas as the leader. As the trial dragged on from October 13th through January 12th, the situation worsened for Leibas. On January 12th, the verdict was read and sentencing 17 of the 22 defendants. The punishment was harsh. The jury found Leibas, Jose Ruiz, and Bobby Tellez guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced them to life imprisonment in San, Qu San Quentin prison. Everyone except for Hank ended up in prison. He was embittered about the trial and his incar incar incarceration. I'm so sorry. He was put in the hole several times for fighting and was eventually transferred to a higher security facility where he stayed for most three months. While Henry Zalevas was in jail, the worst violence against Mexican Americans to date occurred on the streets of Los Angeles. While the boys were incarcerated, violence against Mexican Americans was spreading on the streets of Los Angeles. Young men were attacked by servicemen and civilians who presumed them to be gang members and juvenile delinquents. Los Angeles media antagonized and helped criminalize zoot suitors, primarily, primarily Mexican American youth. Article titles referred to zoot suitors at, as hoodlums and juveniles, and also associated them with gangs. Finally, on October 2, 1944, the Second District Court of Appeals overturned the Sleepy Lagoon verdicts and Judge Clement Nye dismissed the case, clearing the boys' record. The boys were eager to return to their old lives. Hank Levas remained embittered, however, and not long after his release, was in prison for selling drugs, this time for 10 to 12 years. In later years, Leva's life became more stable. He operated a restaurant, Hanks on Witter Boulevard in East Los Angeles, where members of his family worked. That's when on July 6, 1971, 
Hank left a bar to inform his family that he will be heading soon, and not long after, he died of a heart attack. Hank died when he was 48 years old. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, Bianca, what was, um, what would you say was your favorite part about learning something while doing this research? Okay, so my favorite part was the whole thing because honestly, um, right now in 2021, I, it, the discrimination towards, um, as you can say, black people and the discrimination of how even civilians and police officers were being type, they were mistreating minorities. So I think my favorite part of this was how we can relate to this such as now in 2021, we like minorities can actually relate to this topic in general. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bianca. Um, all right, so I, again, I would love to thank um, Dr. Aurelio Montemayor, Dr. Jean Morales, Dr. Liliana Saldana, Dr. Margaret Cantu Sanchez, Thank you so much for sitting in on these presentations. This is something that we've never done. This is the first time, and we had such a great turnout. And I would love to thank you guys. Um, also, I would and so I would like to also thank um, the students, of course, for uh, presenting and doing so well. The uh, they were all very nervous. They weren't nervous yesterday, and then today they came in a little nervous. Um, but I wanted to know, is there something, because y'all are all professors um, that deal with Mexican-American studies of some sort or of another, um, I wanted to know, is there anything you feel that we might have left out of our research? Oh, this is this case not only highlights how Mexican people were racially profiled, brutalized by police and criminalized by media, but also points to systemic and class oppression that Mexican experienced in LA with similar conditions in other regions. Excellent there, Bianca. All right. Um, if y'all have any other, thank you to happy to continue the conversation. Mr. Dominguez. Yes. Thank you so much for inviting us. I really appreciated how each, how the students in, in a way dissected parts of this case because there's so much to explore, um, <laughs> right? There's so much to explore in this case. I mean, from like the actual, um, you know, the case, the, the, the trial to the media, you know, how the media portrayed, how, uh, the police brutalized the Mexicans and rounded them up and, and basically, um, and to my knowledge, this is, um, there were about 600 youth that were rounded up, right? I mean, so, so much to this case, you know, and, and to look at the existing conditions that Mexicans experienced, I think this is why the, the, the Sleepy Lagoon case is such an important part of Mexican American history and why it stands out. Right, thank you. Oh, uh, um, uh, yeah, there, there is so much to this case where, you know, um, just like any point in history, there's so much to cover and usually focused on one part. And, you know, we like to break it up. In fact, uh, we're so next week, we are starting more research projects. Um, and then and kind of brings me to my next point, if any of y'all would like to sit in on future presentations right now, um, next week we have star testing. So there, I'm only going to see these kids once, but I've only been working with these kids since January. Our school does semesters. Okay. So from uh, August to December or like mid January was the first semester. And then I think y'all came in like the January 20th or something. And so I've only had these kids for what, four, three months, four months. And um, the first thing we do is like, I'm like, let's, let's start researching. Um, we have future presentations. And going to be Frank Tito's versus the Hemisphere, 1968, the Chicano Moratorium, Mecha, Brown Berets, Raza Unida Party, UFW Party. May 1970 student strikes and Edgewood versus Kirby. Um, and so because our, our district breaks up our, our content into semesters, 
I feel like it's so rushed because there's so much about Mexican American studies. And I think when the kids come in, they think, oh, we're going to learn about Selena. I'm like, that's at the end. If, if we even get to that, we still got to cover everything. So we start from um, the, the crossing of the Bering Strait, because that's where you got to start all the indigenous history. And then we get into uh, Mexican American studies. And so, you know, I have to break it up with so much of research of you do a little here, you do a little here because it, there's so much content to get through in exactly. just five months. <laughs> yes. um, did, uh, does anyone else uh, have any other comments about some of these research projects? It's uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to thank you again. And I was just really impressed with, as um, Dr. Saldana said, just the um, thoroughness with what they, you know, went about doing this research, um, especially because I'm assuming, um, I'm assuming that, that students didn't know about some of these things. Like I, I didn't learn about this in history class. And so I, I really commend you and them for exploring these elements of history that have not and are not typically part of our um, history classes. And everyone is really thorough in you know, taking apart and looking at things like the importance of media, um, the connections between history and today. As uh, Bianca was going through that last presentation, I was thinking about the Porvenir massacre. I was thinking about the Texas Rangers. I was even thinking about El Paso recently. So I'm, I'm really, really excited to hear that students are making these connections. So I'm super impressed with you guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you. One more smiling. Um, and like I said, uh, the reason why I wanted to invite y'all was to see, because I know y'all know what y'all are teaching in the college level. And I know Mexican American studies is a pretty new topic in Texas. I think this is my second year teaching it or third year. Uh, so it hasn't been around that long. So I would love to see. So y'all know what we're teaching in the classrooms. Um, and uh, most of this class, I'd say, uh, have y'all learned about any of these topics before? No, sir. A tiny bit. And I heard a yes. Which topics have you heard before? An overall summary? Yeah. Okay. Not detailed. Not even in the U.S. history. No. So um, I do like to cover some of the topics that are sometimes left out of U.S. history for maybe uh, state testing or preference. Um, I mean, I think that especially Brasero project, I mean, Brasero program and repatriation are topics that continue to in America in 2021, um, but you know, are sometimes left out in history books or left out in history discussions. Um, so I, uh, that's why I try and bring it in. Um, okay, well, that is, we're about to pack up because they're gonna make the announcements for us to start cleaning our classrooms. But I would, again, I would love to send my uh, thank yous out to everyone who showed up, Dr. Aurelio Montemayor, Dr. G. Morales, Dr. Liliana Saldana, and Dr. Margaret Cantu Sanchez. And I will be letting y'all know about the future presentations. And maybe when we start field trips again, maybe, I know field trips are kind of banned right now. Maybe our, my Mexican, my future Mexican American classes can stop by some of these universities and get to meet some of the people um, because I do take them on a tour of the West Side because I'm from the San Antonio's West Side. And uh, we go look at murals. We go to the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. And, uh, and we, we like to, I, I like to just show them around and like give them a little brief history of San Antonio uh, culture and, uh, maybe we can stop by some of these universities. Okay. Be wonderful. Um, <laughs> thank you. Y'all have a very lovely weekend um, for my students. Have a good weekend. Stay safe. Thank you. Stay safe, please. Thank you. Yes, same to you. Thank have a good you. one. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, students. Thanks. Bye.